23rd decree, the year 2025, seven horns, ten crowns. Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. A past and present day application. Daniel chapter 7 verse 14. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. 23rd decree, the year 2025, seven horns, ten crowns. The table of contents. Section 1, the falling away, the early Christian church. Section 2, a lesson from history, Babylon of old. Section 3, who shall think to change times and laws? Section 4. The connection between 325 AD and 2025. Section 5. The mystery. Babylon the Great. Section 6. The last epoch in earth history. Section 7. The United States of America repeating the history of Rome. Conclusion. Psalm 91, verses 1 to 4. Section 1, The Falling Away, The Early Christian Church. Part 1a, What is the Falling Away? The falling away is the apostasy from the truth of the gospel. The year 81 to 99. Taken from the book The Two Republics, written by A.T. Jones, pages 203-206. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day the coming of Christ shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This plainly sets forth the prophecy of a great falling away or apostasy from the truth of the gospel. Acts chapter 20 verses 29 and 30, Paul says, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. It was from those who would arise not only speaking perverse things, but speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Through error of judgment, a man might speak perverse things with no bad intention. But the ones here mentioned would speak perverse things purposely and with the intention of making disciples for themselves, to draw away disciples after them instead of to draw disciples to Christ. These would pervert the truth and would have to pervert the truth in order to accomplish their purpose. When one seeks to draw disciples to himself and put himself in the place of Christ, then he must pervert the truth and accommodated to the wishes of those whom he hopes to make his own disciples. This is wickedness. This is apostasy. Part 1b, The Reasons for the Falling Away From the book of A.T. Jones, pages 206-207 The Falling Away, The Bishops Pervert Their Calling there was another consideration which made the danger the more imminent. These words were spoken to the bishops. It was a company of bishops to whom the Apostle Paul was speaking when he said, Of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. 
from that order of men who were chosen to guide and to care for the church of Christ, from those who were set to protect the church, from this order of men, there would be those who would pervert their calling, their office, and the purpose of it to build up themselves and gather disciples to themselves in the place of Christ. To watch this spirit, to check its influence, and to guard against its workings was constant effort of the apostle. And for the reason as stated to the Thessalonians, that the mystery of iniquity was already working. There were at that time elements abroad which the apostle could plainly see would develop into all that the scriptures had announced. And scarcely were the last of the apostles dead when the evil appeared in its practical workings. Part 1c, the falling away widespread already in AD 120. Continuing with the book of A.T. Jones, page 207. The falling away, the Christian doctors introduced external rites. No sooner were the apostles removed from the stage of action, no sooner was their watchful attention gone and their apostolic authority removed, than this very thing appeared of which the apostle had spoken. Certain bishops, in order to make easier the conversion of the heathen, to multiply disciples, and by this increase their own influence and authority, began to adopt heathen customs and forms. When the canon of scripture was closed and the last of the apostles was dead, the first century was gone, and within 20 years of that time, the perversion of the truth of Christ had become widespread. In the history of this century and of this subject, the record is, it is certain that to religious worship, both public and private, many rites were added without necessity and to the offense of sober and good man, according to the writer Moshim. And the reason of this is stated to be that the Christians were pronounced atheists because they were destitute of temples, altars, victims, priests, and all that pomp in which the vulgar supposed the essence of religion to consist. For unenlightened persons are prone to estimate religion by what meets their eyes. To silence this accusation, the Christian doctors thought it necessary to introduce some external rites which would strike the senses of the people so that they could maintain themselves really to possess all those things of which Christians were charged with being destitute, though under different forms. Part 1D, The Falling Away and Paganism, AD 120. The Falling Away, Steps to Edenize Christianity. Pagan Mysteries, continuing with page 208. This was at once to accommodate the Christian worship and its forms to that of the Eden, and almost at one step to Edenize Christianity. No Eden element or form can be connected with Christianity or its worship, and Christianity remains pure. Of all the ceremonies of the Eden, the mysteries were the most sacred and most universally practiced. But whatever was the mystery that was celebrated, there was always in it, as an essential part of it, the elements of abomination that characterized sun worship everywhere. Because the mysteries were simply forms of the widespread and multiform worship of the sun. Among the first of the perversions of the Christian worship was to give to its forms the title and air of the mysteries. For says the record, among the Greeks and the people of the East, nothing was held more sacred than what were called the mysteries. These circumstances led the Christians, in order to impart dignity to their religion, to say that they also had similar mysteries or certain holy rites concealed from the vulgar 
and they not only applied the terms used in the pagan mysteries to Christian institution, particularly baptism and the Lord's Supper, but they gradually introduced also the rites which were designated by those terms. Part 1e, the falling away and sun worship, AD 150. Reprove the works of darkness, such as the worship of the sun. Continuing with pages 211, 212, the pagan mysteries being a form of sun worship, the secret symbols cannot be described with decency. It is not necessary to describe the actions that were performed in the celebration of the mysteries that were performed in the celebration of the mysteries after the initiation any further than is spoken by the apostle with direct reference to this subject. Ephesians chapter 5 verses 11 and 12 Have no fellowship, says Paul, with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. It was to accommodate the Christian worship to the minds of a people who practiced these things that the bishops gave to the Christian ordinances the name of mysteries. The Lord's Supper was made the greater mystery, baptism the lesser. Therefore, before the second century, around 150 AD, was half gone, before the last of the apostle had been dead 40 years, this apostasy, this working of the mystery of iniquity, had so largely spread over both the East and the West, that it is literally true that a large part, therefore, of the Christian observances and institutions, even in this century, at the aspect of the pagan mysteries. Nor is this all. The worship of the sun by then had become universal. These apostates, not being content with so much as the sun worship as appeared in the celebration of the mysteries, adopted the Eden custom of worshiping toward the east and of the day of the sun, Sunday, as a festival day. To such an extent were the forms of sun worship practiced in this apostasy that before the close of the second century, the Eden themselves charged these so-called Christians with worshiping the sun. Part 1F, The Falling Away and Easter, AD 150 from Passover to Easter Sunday. Continuing with page 213. From Rome, there came now another addition to the sun-worshipping apostasy. The first Christians, being mostly Jews, continued to celebrate the Passover in remembrance of the death of Christ, the true Passover. And this was continued among those who from among the Gentiles had turned to Christ. Accordingly, the celebration was always on the Passover day, the 14th day of the first month, according to Leviticus chapter 23, verse 5. Rome, however, and from all the West, adopted the day of the sun as the day of this celebration. According to the Eastern custom, the celebration being on the 14th day of the month would of course fall on different days of the week when compared to the Roman Julian calendar. As the years revolved, the rule of Rome was that the celebration must always be on a Sunday, the Sunday nearest to the 14th day of the first month of the Jewish year. And if the 14th day of that month of the Jewish year should be on Sunday, then the celebration was not to be held on that day, but upon the next Sunday. One reason of this was not only to be as like Eden as possible, but to be as unlike the Jews as possible. This in order not only to facilitate the conversion of the Eden by conforming to their customs, but also by pandering to their spirit of contempt and hatred of the Jews. It was upon this point that the Bishop of Rome made his first open attempt at absolutism. 
Part 2a, The Falling Away, Church and State, AD 321 to 325. What happened from AD 321 to 325? The Great Controversy, pages 574-575. While edicts, general councils, and church ordinances sustained by secular power were the steps by which the pagan festival of Sunday attained its position of honor in the Christian world. The first public measure enforcing Sunday observance was the law enacted by Constantine in AD 321, and we invite you to read the appendix note for page 53 on the history of AD 321. This edict required townspeople to rest on the venerable day of the sun but permitted countrymen to continue their agricultural pursuits. Though virtually a hidden statute, it was enforced by the emperor after his nominal acceptance of Christianity. The royal mandate, not proving a sufficient substitute for divine authority, Zibius, a bishop who sought the favor of princes and who was the special friend and flatterer of Constantine, advanced the claim that Christ had transferred the Sabbath to Sunday. Not a single testimony of the scriptures was produced in proof of the new doctrine. Eusebius himself unwittingly acknowledges its falsity and points to the real authors of the change. All things, he says, whatever that it was duty to do on the Sabbath, these we have transferred to the Lord's day. The reference is taken from Sabbath Laws and Sabbath Duties from Robert Cox, page 538. But the Sunday argument, groundless as it was, served to embolden men in trampling upon the Sabbath of the Lord. All who desired to be honored by the world accepted the popular festival. Part 2b, The Falling Away, the Decree of Nicaea and A.D. 325. What was the significance of the first decree of Nicaea? We invite you to peruse the link that we submitted to you on the First Council of Nicaea. The First Council of Nicaea held in Nicaea in Bithynia, in present-day Turkey, convoked by the Roman Empire Constantine I in 325, was the first ecumenical conference of bishops of the Christian Church and most significantly resulted in the first uniform Christian doctrine. With the creation of the Nicene Creed or Credo in Latin, a precedent was established for subsequent general ecumenical councils of bishops or synods, the intent being to define unity of beliefs for the whole of Christendom a momentous event in the history of the Church and subsequent history of Europe. Beside attempting to resolve disagreements over the nature of Christ, another result of the Council was an agreement on the date of the Christian Passover, or Pascha in Greek and Easter in modern English, which is the most important feast of the ecclesiastical Roman calendar. The Council decided in favor of celebrating Jesus' resurrection on the first Sunday after the first full moon following the vernal equinox, independently and contrary to the Bible Hebrew calendar, which points to first fruits as being the resurrection of Christ, and authorized the Bishop of Alexandria, presumably using the Alexandrian calendar, to announce annually the exact date to his fellow bishops. The Council of Nicaea was historically significant because it was the first effort to attain consensus in the Church through an assembly representing all of Christendom. It was, in fact, the first occasion for the development of technical Christology. Further, Constantine's role in the Council was viewed in retrospect as a clear precursor of future imperial control over the Church. Part 3a, A Succession of Falls The Fall of Adam, 
the fall of Israel, the fall of the Christian church to today. Taken from the book Confrontation, written by Mrs. Ellen G. White, pages 73-74. If the race had ceased to fall when Adam was driven from Eden, we should now be in a far more elevated condition physically, mentally, and morally. But while men deplore the fall of Adam, which has resulted in such unutterable woe, they disobey the express injunctions of God, as did Adam, although they have his example to warn them from doing as he did in violating the law of Jehovah. Would that man had stopped falling with Adam? But there has been a succession of falls. Men will not take warning from Adam's experience. They will indulge appetite and passion in direct violation of the law of God and at the same time continue to mourn Adam's transgression, which brought sin into the world. From Adam's day to ours, there has been a succession of falls, each greater than the last. Now paraphrasing the same book, pages 73, 74, and regarding the succession of falls in the Christian church. If the Christian church, like Israel of old, had ceased to fall when the bishops of the primitive church perverted their calling, we should now be in a far more elevated condition physically, mentally, and spiritually as the seventh church. But while the leader and church member deplore the falling away, which has resulted in such unutterable woe, the Roman Catholic Church, they disobey the express injunctions of God as did the first Christian leaders, although they have their example to warn them from doing as they did in violating the law of Jehovah and mingling with paganism and false education. Would that the church had stopped falling with them. But there has been a succession of falls. Christ's church does not take warning from their experience. They indulge appetite and passion in direct violation of the law of God, and at the same time continue to mourn the first leader's transgression, which brought evil into the church. From the first century to our century, there has been a succession of falls, each greater than the last.